So good to have Garen back from school and leading singing for us. Good to see you, Garen. Thank you for doing so well. Let's turn in our Bibles to Luke chapter 2 for our scripture reader tonight. Reading. I will be the reader. Luke chapter 2. We're going to begin in verse 8, and this will be from the English Standard Version. Luke chapter 2. In the same region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over the flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace amongst those with whom he is pleased. Whenever the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and to see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste, and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told to them concerning the child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds had told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen as it had been told them. Peace on earth is the title of our lesson for this evening, but I want you to juxtapose it with sidelining anger as the second part of that. All right. Peace on earth. We know that Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 26 says to be angry and to sin not. Do not let the sin go down on your anger and do not give opportunity to the devil. The angels here declare peace on earth, right? And goodwill towards men. But Jesus says in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 34 that I came to bring a sword and not to bring peace. How do you justify, how do you rectify those, those two things with one another? If you were to look at Psalm 139, at the very end of Psalm 139, you can see the psalmist dealing with the feeling of hatred and of anger there because the psalmist is bidding God to take vengeance upon the enemies of the Lord in which the psalmist has feelings towards those enemies that we as Christians might think, well, that's not very nice because he is bidding for God to bring down punishment and to bring down judgment upon them. Is there a time for anger? Notice in Ephesians chapter 4, if you looked at that passage in verse 26, that it says to be angry and do not sin. It does not say if you want to avoid sin, never get angry. How does that compute with our Christian walk? How do you handle anger? And is it okay to be angry from time to time? Well, look at this example with me. Go with me with, to John chapter 2, where Jesus comes into Jerusalem. He has begun his ministry. As he comes into Jerusalem, he noticed things about the temple that he is not pleased with. Uh, we're not going to take time to read this, but if you would like to, you can start there in verse 13 of John chapter 2. But he sees that the temple has been turned into a marketplace, that it's been turned into a Walmart for spiritual things, that there is money that is exchanging hands, that there are animal sacrifices that are being bought. And he knows that there is corruption amongst them because he says, you den of thieves. And what he sees are things that are supposed to be spiritual and draw men closer to God and they have been turned into things that are spiritual and they are actually distancing men from a proper relationship with their heavenly father. Isn't that nice that we don't have that problem today where things are turned their, on their head in the religious world? What does Jesus do? The word for anger within the Greek is orge and it simply means to have a temper. It means to get caught up in a violent emotion and it can be translated indignation. Jesus is angry here so much so that he takes a 
the cords and fashions a whip and goes into the temple. This is our Savior, right? Peace on earth. He goes into the temple and he begins to turn over the money changers table. Coins are going everywhere and he drives out the animals and the people that are there. Does that fit with Ephesians chapter 4 with be ye angry and sin not? Is Jesus keeping things under control or has he lost it? Because to lose one's temper, that is not a virtue. Do you have a problem with that? My wife would tell you, Jed has a problem with that. Now, the way in which I handled my temper whenever we are first married, thankfully, she has seen me through those days. And it is not, now I'm not saying that I do not get angry anymore, but there are ways in which to handle situations and to talk about things and to leave things alone at certain times and to come back and to talk about them later. I'm not saying that it's always best not to talk about things. I'm just saying there has come an understanding between how to communicate. Do you have a problem with anger? Do you lose your temper? Are there times whenever you say things that 20 minutes later you realize, oh no, I really shouldn't have said that, or do things that you come to a realization of, I really shouldn't have done that. We are people of passion. To get angry in the New Testament means to be overcome by a violent emotion. It could be pride, it could be envy, it could be jealousy, but your temper is lost. Is Jesus here so caught up to the extent that he is behaving in a way that 20 minutes later he is going to say, well, I really shouldn't have done that? And the answer is no, because his anger is righteous. Remember another word that that uh, can be translated to is indignation. Jesus is upset because they are not honoring God and he has every right to do what he does in correcting them. Now, we as humans, listen, we get caught up in our emotions and sometimes we don't practice the best of judgment whenever we are caught up in our emotions. We uh, get our passions going and then immediately our judgment seems to go right out the window. Jesus is not such in such a state whenever he is doing this. What he is doing needed to be done. In fact, turn with me to an Old Testament uh, example. Look at Numbers chapter 25. Can you think of a man who was complimented for driving a spear through two bodies, a Midianite and an Israelite, and that he was complimented by God for doing so. This man understood God had condemned sexual immorality and the Midianites had come in and they had infiltrated the camp and they had begun to teach their religious practices, which let's just be plain, it was sexual immorality in the guise of religion and God had told the leaders before, he says, you make sure any of the leaders that are doing this, that you put them to death and right in the midst of a prayer that the men are having to God, asking the Lord to give them the strength that they need in order to accomplish the task that God has set them to do, a man brings in a Midianite woman into the camp and into his tent, and Phinehas, who is a priest's son, son of Aaron, picks up a spear and he drives it through both the man and the woman, killing them. And God says, Phinehas has done that which has stayed my hand from destroying this nation. Phineas is to be blessed. Now, what was Phineas caught up in? And if you want to look at Numbers chapter 25, look specifically at verse 11 and following, and you will see that it was a jealousy for the Lord, is what it says. Phineas was insulted by man's disobedience to his heavenly father. Righteous indignation, anger. Sometimes that word is translated passion, zeal, ardor, feeling a displeasure that is in line with what God feels. Now, you're already ahead of me and you're thinking to yourself, you know, this really isn't any lesson like I have ever heard on peace on earth. How is he going to tie all of these things back together? Well, let's go back to that announcement. Go back with me to Luke chapter 2. And I want you to notice something that is often overlooked. As the angels sing and bring praises and announce the coming of Christ in Luke chapter 2, they say, peace on earth, goodwill towards men. But what does the rest of that phrase say? With whom he is pleased is the way some translations have it. Peace on earth to men, your version may say a little bit more plain than mine, but peace on earth to men who do God's 
bidding. Now, we would all love to live in a place where there's no war, there's no conflict, when everybody is getting along. Where is that place? Is that your house? <laughs> is it my house? Is it the congregation of the Lord's family? That place on earth where peace on earth is almost pie in the sky, that is an eternal concept that we probably will not have as far as all men being together and always getting along until we get to heaven. Because James says in James chapter 4 that when men live by their passions, remember that violent emotion that is within us, then they desire things that they cannot have because they ask amiss and having not, then they make war with one another. From whence do wars come? They come from within us. Conflicts arise from from me yielding to my anger and to my temper and my passions, losing control and not practicing sound or good judgment. That's why we can't have much in the way of peace on earth. And I certainly think that that's why we shouldn't expect to, on this earth and within this world to think that there's going to come a time when we're not going to have any wars because what would that require of each and every individual? That would mean in order to have peace on earth in that fashion, each and every in individual on earth would have to be doing that which God would have them to do, to be ple pleasing. And is that going to ever happen? What was being announced then by the angels when Jesus came is a simple concept. Christ is bringing the opportunity for reconciliation to God for those who desire to follow him. Peace on earth, goodwill to men who are pleasing to God. Jesus was saying in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 34, I came not to bring peace but a sword because he was saying, I know there is within the heart of every individual these things that need to be cut out, that need to be cast away. These passions, these longings, these desires that basically personify themselves within a selfish attitude that cause conflict within our lives. When I think only of myself, I don't get along with anybody else unless they're doing exactly what I want them to do. And then, boy, if they cross the line, their history. What does God provide for us in this? It's an opportunity to get over ourselves, get ourselves off the throne, and to put him properly there. What happens whenever I live for the Lord, whenever I live for God, whenever I am no longer ruled by my passions and my desires, then I begin to be of service to you as I am in service to my Lord. And I begin to think about your needs more than I think about my own in that man of passion gets set aside. Whenever Jesus cleansed the temple, he was upset because they were supposed to be living a life that was in accordance with God's will. Here they were, they had a name of being religious leaders and how is it that they were acting? With greed, with selfishness. When Phineas took that spear and he plunged it through the bodies of those two, both an Israelite and a Midianite, what was he seeing? Two that were just living in total disagreement with what God's will was for their own, for their own selves. When man does not have control over his desires, he leads a life that is outside of God's will, and it is a life that must need change. When Jesus said, I came to bring a sword, he wasn't saying I am coming to bring wars necessarily. What he was saying is I am going to bring that which is necessary for you to understand there are things that are within you that need to be cut out and cast away. My word is sharper than a double-edged sword, piercing to and dividing us under the joint and the marrow, the soul and the spirit, able to discern the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Right? God's word cuts not like a knife, but it cuts like a double-edged sword. And there are times in my life, in order for me to have peace with God, I have got to change and I have got to cut away activities that are going on. I'm going to have divided families for that reason. It's not because God wants it, but there is going to be a father and maybe a child that pursue the Lord, whereas the mother and another child do not. Peace on earth. Well, that all depends if there are those who do God's bidding and accomplish his will in setting aside their own selfish desires. And so when does anger become sin? Jesus did not sin whenever he cleansed the temple. That was righteous indignation. Phineas was not in a sinful state whenever he did what he did. That was 
by the jealousy of the Lord, it says. Anger becomes sin whenever it controls me to the point where I want to satisfy my own desires, regardless of what is best, regardless of what God has said. Some of the ways that can manifest itself within my life is I carry a grudge towards somebody else, especially somebody within the church. What are we to be? We're supposed to be brothers and sisters within the Lord and within the family. And you say, well, my family, every time we get together, we fight like cats and dogs. Okay, so let's not use that example. All right, let's use the example that we have within the church that by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one to another, right? And what is love? Doing what is best for another regardless of the cost or how you're treated in return. Anger is sin when it harms my relationships with my brothers and sisters in Christ. Be angry and sin not. Turn with me to the book of James. We've been looking at James chapter 4 where it talks about the passions that are within us, that they cause conflict uh, outside of us. But look at what James says in James chapter 1, beginning in verse 19. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, Slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. What makes you angry? What frustrates you? What is it that stirs up within you to the point sometimes where you clench your teeth and you're just almost shaken? You know, that's actually the picture there within the New Testament of violent emotion. What is it that sets you off? Now, if you are a good observer of other people, you can begin to tell pretty quickly the types of things that we call it uh, pushing their buttons. And... Uh, Sometimes I don't know what it is about us and maybe just life gets a little too boring and you know Let's just push a button here and before you know it, you know, they they go off the handle, right? What is it that sets you off? within the church Are you good at pushing buttons? <laughs> is there just a need sometimes to stir the pot and to see those things that can come to the top? I think sometimes we push one another's buttons and we don't even realize it because we're just not being sensitive. And we will say something without even knowing the way in which somebody else will interpret what we are saying. And what happens before you know it, we begin to build walls between. Buttons get pushed. Anger begins to build. And we will go weeks without even talking to a brother or a sister in Christ. Is, is that good? Is that healthy? Is that what God had in mind? No, that's the very point of Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 26, to be ye angry and to sin not. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Take care of it. You may have even done it unintentionally, but you make sure that you reconcile. Then, peace on earth. That's what Jesus is teaching. That opportunity for forgiveness, that you might be reconciled with God, has been given unto you so that you might have that exact same attitude with everybody else so that you might be reconciled with our brothers. Our Savior did it. Peace on earth. For those who are serving the Lord, it is intentional. Where should be the safest, most secure, best place to be? I believe it's amongst the family of the Lord. We ought to be the safest. This ought to be the best. We ought to be the most encouraged when we are together. This ought to be the place where forgiveness just flows like a river where we don't have conflicts that last because we don't desire anything but to be like what our savior is selfishness is set aside passions are not a part of us and we are not allowing them to direct us at least uh, in an ungodly way we are always going to be people of passion we love one another we desire to be united within christ peace on earth and goodwill towards men yes because God has come into our life and he has changed it. His word, his sword has separated me from that selfish person and placed him squarely upon the throne within my heart to do his bidding. So let me ask you, are you at peace? Are you happy? And you say, well, preacher, if what you've been talking about it within my own household, I mean, I, I would love for that to be true. I mean, but we have a hard time getting along. It's hard, it's hard for me to get along with my wife or it's hard to, for us as, as a family with the kids to the parents to get along. Well, does your happiness depend upon others? Jesus brought peace. 
Uh, he said there are going to be families that are split and that are rendered, and yet he wasn't saying that those ones that were coming out of that situation weren't going to experience the exact same peace as everyone else. Paul, whenever he was speaking in Philippians chapter 4, says you will have a peace that passes understanding whenever you follow Christ because your mind is set upon those things that are different than the way the world sees it. Is there really anything more valuable? Is there any greater gift that Christ has given you? than your salvation. If that is not the greatest gift that you have ever received, then what is it? I mean, and that is why we can say it doesn't matter, right? I am happy with that and nothing else. And that's why Paul was able to say, I, I desire to know nothing else except for Christ and him crucified. Why? Because Paul knew that translates into forgiveness. That translates into salvation. That translates into reconciliation with God. If your peace depends upon who you're with or what you're doing or where you live, then it's not a peace that comes from God, not totally. Now, maybe you're immature in the faith and you're growing and you're learning, okay. But I should be at peace with myself because I am a child of God regardless of the circumstances that I find myself in, regardless. That is a peace that is on this earth that's in anticipation of eternal glory with God through the hope that he has given us. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one to another. And so let us be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Sidelining angry whenever it's coming from a heart of selfishness, but don't be afraid to have anger towards the wickedness that you see that is within the world, desiring for God's will to be brought forth, having that passion to accomplish what God desires for you to do, but be careful to behave appropriately. Righteous indignation was praised in Phineas, right, by God, but it's because God was commanding such a thing to be done. We must make sure that our anger is not from me it's not from man because we have clearly seen there that the anger that comes from man does not accomplish the will of god why are you angry gotta admit oftentimes it's because i'm selfish it is it's because i'm selfish i rarely i think are we actually burning with anger of jealousy for the lord um, maybe but rarely christ came to bring peace and reconciliation from the Father. He said simply, you come to me, all that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I will take your life of meaninglessness and I will transform you into my servant. I will wash your sins. I will raise you to walk into my service and I'll make it to where that reconciliation with God you have within your heart, not only for yourself, but for everyone that is around you. As much as is within you, live at peace with all men, especially those of the household of faith you do good unto them. A Christian can be, in any society, I think, the best, still, the, the most loving and kind and joyous person, no matter what kind of society that they live in. And it can be, as we have talked about before and in classes, in a communistic type of, or a dictator or an imperialistic, it matters not. We can be and have our joy and our peace because that comes from Christ. God desires for you to have that peace. If you have not experienced that, it is found within the watery grave of baptism, having your sins washed away, having the hope of eternal life being given unto you. If in any way, after having that peace, you are experiencing the angst that comes with wrestling with your own passions, please come as we stand and as we sing.